Welcome to Off the Shelf. I'm your host, Yvonne Wolf. Today, our special guest is investment professional and author of Money Map, John Nicholas. Welcome, John. Thank you for having me. So, John, what motivates you to write this book? Well, I wanted to share you know, what I've learned over the past you know, 30 years or so of investing money, managing money, uh, help, helping people you know, plan their financial futures. So I decided to put that into a book and share it with others. And you have some experience in this area, right? You have helped others publish or? Um, I've you know, managed money for, you know, across different kinds of organizations, uh, banks and um, different kind of investment groups. And I edited some books on the financial area and had done written some articles. I started out my career as a lawyer, so I wrote a few articles on legal topics. And then I, I had uh, edited some books on the financial area for other people. So I decided that uh, at some point I would write a book of my own. I see, I see. And I guess um, COVID did give us a little time to, <laughs> to, to put that into right. reality. Right, more time at home, some time to uh, you know, take the time to write, write a little bit every day as much as I could and you know, write a little bit every day and it adds up and it turned into a book. Ah, wow, well, that you make it sound so easy, John. <laughs> no, yeah. So, um, when in the process of writing this book, what, or did you decide way, way in the beginning that it would be self-published? Or you know, I did. I thought about maybe going through a publisher, but I just thought it would be maybe easier to uh, self-publish, and so that's what I decided to do. And this process has been, I mean, what would you say this process with Amazon has it been easy or difficult? Or I'd say it's easy. You know, they make it very easy to publish. There are other groups, you, as you may know, you can publish through as well. Amazon is very easy, and the distribution, of course, is very good. And that's why I decided to use them. But it's a very easy process. The hard part is, of course, writing the book and, and getting the layout done. And in my case, a lot of graphics, a lot of charts. I so that was that. a more challenging part. Um, it's a kind of amazing with Amazon. You just send them the, you know, your your book, and they, a week or two later, your book appears in your on your doorstep, all yeah. printed in the cover and color and everything. Wow. So, tell us a little bit about that because I know you, as you mentioned, your book does have graphs, charts, and color too. And choosing to print in color is was that a decision you made way in the beginning? Initially, I used all different charts and graphs that mm -hmm. I just sort of cut and pasted from other publications that were related to what I was writing about. And then I had someone read my draft, and they said, well, maybe you should have uniform charts and colors. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, okay. And so I uh, hired a sort of a graphic illustrator to create uniform charts and graphs and uniform colors, uniform fonts, which uh, looks very nice in the book, but it did take you know quite a while to yeah. do. <laughs> I can't mm -hmm. imagine. I can't imagine that mm -hmm. is a whole another layer of um, formatting, adjusting, and so you you say you hired someone to do that. Where did you did you someone you know, or did you go to a? I agency? used uh, an online site called Upwork. So a lot of freelancers um, do a variety of of work there. So I found actually found an editor there, a graphic designer, and I uh, found the person to help me with the book cover. And I found another person uh, to do layouts. So actually lay out the, the font and the charts and, the, and all the titles in the book so it would look nice and uniform. Um, so I hired them as freelancers. And they actually, as a group, they did a very good job. Oh, I think it's, it's mm -hmm. amazing, right? The, the kind of work that goes behind a book like this and you think of it as a um, how-to or a nonfiction yeah. yeah, and I have a lot of um, sites, a lot of citations, a lot of footnotes in my book. Mm -hmm. I actually had someone help with that to make sure that I was citing the right book and the right page oh, number uh, of that. who I was quoting. And that took time, and it's good to have another set of eyes, you know, checking everything that you do. Wow, I didn't think of that. I was yeah. thinking just making the footnotes appear on the correct page is, yeah, is yeah. already it. It's, uh, well, you know, writing a novel, you don't have to worry about, you know, all of that and footnotes and if there's a quote right and is that the right page. But I was really trying to do it as professionally as possible and have everything, um, you know, 
tie out and, and, and be done correctly. Yeah, I can imagine. I'm your, your background as a lawyer. You don't want any of that to be uh, uh, an error. Uh, no, Money Map, that's a very attractive title. Yeah. In the cover, you, you found someone as well, too. Did, was there a few choices or that like they proposed you or to you? Know, you, I, or did you I came up with the design. Mm, okay. And I'd always liked money maps ever since I was a kid. You know, mm. a lot of pirate movies and Treasure Island and That's all right. that. So I always liked, you know, the, the map that had the, the line on it and at the end was the buried treasure. So what I thought about, well, at the end of your, your life is a lifetime journey of managing your money, managing your wealth, financial planning. At the end of it is hopefully financial security, mm -hmm. which is sort of the treasure. So um, I thought about that as a design. I like the idea, and you can see on my book, it, it maps out on the front different stages of mm -hmm. you know, asset allocation and selecting investments and maybe working with an advisor and risk and whatnot. And so that's what I charted across the front and back of the book. Nice. And I had a help from a very good uh, graphic designer who helped you know, do the artwork and you know lay out the front and back cover and uh, so she did a, a wonderful yeah. job of it i think wow i think so too it's yeah. definitely uh, has a very appealing top um cover for something yeah. that might be a little intimidating for people yeah to well i did have one person who saw the cover was very interested in the book and then realized it was a book on investing in finance and then wasn't as interested <laughs> <laughs> well i think we need some a good cover for us, a topic that's right that's actually very practical and helpful for our financial future, right? Yeah. I mean, I, um, over this COVID time, I read about the dynamics of, or the dimensions of our wellness. And part of that is, is the financial wellness, like how secure we feel in uh, our daily lives, right? Right, and, and in retirement as well. You know, most people um, you know, may have a, a nowadays a 30-year retirement. Oh, so yes. it's a long time to plan and think about and Make sure that, uh, you know, what goals you want to achieve, you can achieve, and that you also have the money to, to live through that, you know, long period of retirement. Oh, I definitely think it's something we, in our generation, didn't think about that it would be such a much longer retirement. I mean, almost as many years as you worked, whereas it wasn't. Right. It used to be fewer years than you worked. Right, yeah. I, I read a statistic the other day. I think it said if you're a... 60 years old and you're, you know, you know a couple, um, odds are one of you, it's about 50% at least, that one of you will make it into well into your 90s. Oh so gosh. that's a long time to, you know, live and, and plan and, and you know, have the money to support you, you in that retirement. Yes. Well, I think there's definitely a need for such advice because our, again, like our previous generation didn't have to think about that. Didn't yeah. even or reaching 60 was something already right and, and then on top of that I know um, several of my friends who are in their 80s they tell me that there's actually two retirement stages you should plan for the one between 65 to 80 and mm -hmm. then thereafter right. right so very very interesting and, and how good are you at social media and since self-publishing you might have to do some of that yourself I'm okay. Um, you know, I've done some videos on financial topics that I posted on LinkedIn and also YouTube. I've done some promotion, as I mentioned, through Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, so I've done some, but um, you know, you always learn, and it's always the amount of time you want to spend it and, and money you want to spend on it as well. Yes, and uh, I've seen your posts on LinkedIn and and not so much um, in, let's say, Instagram or uh, Facebook. Well, I think LinkedIn is probably more of your audience. Yeah, LinkedIn, uh, as you may know, it's more of a professional networking, business networking, so I tend to use that. Uh, YouTube, the videos are open to a, a, you know, really anyone, but they're all on financial topics. So... Uh, I've tried That's to true. tailor what I do to more of a, uh, an audience that is looking for information um, that's not super detailed, but it's informational enough that it'll give them some insights into the financial topics I cover. Oh, I, I think so. That's a, I feel, it, yeah, YouTube many times is a place where people are exploring their topics or just an introduction to many things. Right. Yeah. So, John, in every book there are difficulties that you don't anticipate or you didn't expect expect so was there such for your book 
I mean, outside of the, yeah, the graphs and charts. Yeah, I'd say the, the biggest challenge is, um, one, the layout, laying out the book. That took a long, I'd never done it before, and I worked with someone on it, but that yeah. took quite a bit of time to get everything exactly laid out and all of the titles and all the pages and all the, mm. the charts to fit in the right spot and look right. So that took some time uh, laying that out. And then also editing. Um, you know, you finish something, you think it's done. Yes. And then you read it, you set it aside and you read it and you realize, oh, I need to revise and rewrite. So there was a lot of revising mm. and, and rewriting, which I think made the book better, but it, it takes a lot of time and um, it's, you know, you're always refining, you know, how you're saying something and how you're presenting it. So I would say that's the biggest um, thing is that, not that it took a lot of time, but it, it takes more time than you think to get something to the point you're happy with it and you want to actually publish it and have share with other people. So who is your audience, do you think of? And we talked a little bit about YouTube, about the kind of people who are looking for some information. Is that, it, it's written for like the lay person. So um, someone who has some familiarity with investing, um, but is not an expert. And I wrote the book really in two parts. The first part is general uh, information for someone who, you know, understands what a stock and a bond is and has managed mm -hmm. maybe their 401k and, and understands generally about investing. But it's um, more simple and it gives them some general outline on some of my thoughts on you know, how to approach investing, what to think about, how to plan for your future. Some of the later chapters are more detailed and are for someone who wants to get more in the weeds of some more technical aspects of investing. Mm -hmm. But it's not required reading. You can pass over those chapters if you're not interested. So I tried to make it um, user-friendly for more of a beginning, a beginning type investor or someone who's you know, younger, maybe just starting out to manage your money. And then also for someone who's a little more sophisticated, who's interested in certain aspects, um, maybe they've read something about it, but wants a little more uh, detailed analysis. Mm, I see. So it's not a particular air, uh, age group, you would say? No, it's really for anyone, because it really, for a younger person, it gives you a money map, you know how to map out and think about your financial mm. future. And then the same thing for an older person, um, you know, how you might plan for retirement, you know, whether you use an investment advisor or not, you know, things that, you know, people at any stage of their life, you know, might, might find useful. Do you think that investment, uh, handling investment on your own has been more popular now because of the internet? Or do you think people still go to an investment advisor? I think I've read about half of people use an advisor and about half of people do it on, do it on their own. Mm -hmm. So I write in my book, you know, I break it down into three different personality types. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, if you are this kind of person, you're probably a good candidate maybe to manage your money yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're this other kind of person, you know, you might find useful to use in a financial advisor, financial planner, you know, to help you. And it really depends on you know, your personality, what you want to spend your time on, what you're comfortable with. And then you know, there's a fees involved, so there's a cost to that. Is the cost worth it to you to have you know, the financial advice? So I outline that in my chapter on using an investment advisor, what are the pros and cons, and what are things to think about. Mm, so that does help you to, to understand yourself as well. Right. Well, John, I know you talked about longevity, but then when is the best time to retire? Some people are taking that 55 retirement um, and, uh, and going off the sunset. Right, right. Well, as I mentioned in my book, it really planning out your life map. It's really, you know, really thinking through what your objectives are for your life with your money and saving and how you plan to spend it over the course of your life. And then, of course, includes retirement. So if your goal is to retire at 55, um, you should, one, make sure that that's really what you want. You know, I, I had a client that um, yeah, was down in Florida, and I had it was a dinner with this client, sat next to a gentleman who retired at 55 to go fishing and play golf. And I said, well, I would like to do that. And he touched my arm and said, don't do it. Because for him, he realized that it was too early to be retired at 55 for, and that he had always dreamed about this, but the reality was different than what he had always imagined. So it's good to really think through what your retirement and your goals and objectives are for your life. 
You know, another example is, um, you know, saving for your child's education versus retiring at 55. I often hear about that, right? Should we uh, prioritize the, the college so that they are not left with, you know, over $50,000 in debt? Or do we, should we put that priority towards our own retirement as parents who are going to be, you know, who are aging, right? Right. And again, that's a, what, you know, a priority uh, that you should think about and, you know, again, map out for your life how to get there. If your goal is to pay for all your children's college education, that's going to require a different kind of saving and investment than if you yourself want to retire at 55 and, you know, go live on a boat down in Florida or something or on a wine estate in France. Uh, you may think that, you know, it's your child's responsibility to pay their way through college. Another person may think, no, I'm going to save uh, and provide for my children's education. So again, it <laughs> depends on the individual. Uh, but it's the kind of thing you want to think about in advance and, and plan for. And probably, yeah, discuss with your spouse, right? Because sometimes, and I do have lots of friends who are, who are kids are beyond the college age, and now the next thing is marriage or wedding. Do you help them or none at all? And we have, and we definitely know parents who pay the whole thing or say, well, this is all I'm giving each of my children for their wedding when they um, come cr across that, yeah, cross right. that uh, milestone. And that's a good point because your life is not just saving for a, a retirement at some age one day. Mm -hmm. It's all of these life events that uh, require money, really. So maybe you're saving um, as a 30-year-old for a bigger house in five years or 10 years. Uh, maybe you're planning to retire at a certain age. Maybe you're planning to pay for your children's education. Maybe you're have to, planning to pay for a wedding. So all these are sort of intermediate steps through life that require money, and you want to uh, plan for that. And the other thing to plan for many people, it's probably the biggest risk that maybe people don't plan for well enough, is a very long retirement. Mm -hmm. It's living much longer than you thought, and living well into your 90s, maybe live to 100. And you have to provide for that um, in, your, in your savings and in your investment. Mm, I see. Well, on that note, I feel that AARP should not start at 50. <laughs> I think they should <laughs> have to readjust their, um, their limit, or they should start maybe later. Right. And I, you know, a lot of people look at mortality tables, um, but that includes a lot of people, unfortunately, that pass away at a younger age. Mm. If you're healthy and you're 60, uh, you may well live into your you know, 90s or late 80s, um, so you should be prepared for that. Well, John, you talked a little bit about retirement and, you know, going off to sunset, but, but there's, and the longevity as a problem, but what about the actual end? I mean, do, how many people actually just die from one day to the next? Yeah, you know, um, planning for a good end, you know, people like a good end in movies and shows typically, and I, I think it's a good objective for most people to plan for the end of your life. And that oftentimes includes medical issues, can often include cognitive decline. You know, if all of us, if we live long enough, are going to suffer physical um, impairments, illnesses, and cognitive decline. Yeah. So it's useful to plan that out. Uh, I s talk about in the book a uh, section on that. It's good to have a, a team of people you trust around you, that mm -hmm. if something happens to you, either you die or you become incapacitated or have some cognitive issues, that you can rely on. Could be uh, I ideally some objective independent people, could be your accountant, could be a lawyer, could be a financial advisor, could be a, of course a family member that you trust and if they're going to handle your finances have some knowledge about investing. So it's good to have that in place mm -hmm. uh, before you suffer the decline. So planning again, planning in advance is a useful thing to do so that at the end of your life, things are well ordered. That includes having, say, estate planning documents, having a will, maybe a durable power of attorney to give someone the ability to manage your affairs in the event that you're uh, incapable of doing so. And that's a real help um, you know, for you, for your family, to have that well organized in advance. So not having one at all, starting from that point, right, to a full team of people who know exactly how many accounts you have and 
what your investment's health is like. Is that what you're? It's a generally a good idea to um, to you know have a list of your various accounts, mm -hmm. passwords in a secure place, and also have some written instructions about maybe what to do in the event that you are you know, die or incapacitated. Oftentimes in, you know, couples, one couple is the one that is more sophisticated financially and handles all the financial affairs. Right. Uh, so th this other spouse may need help or may, of course, need to know where all the assets are. And at a time when you may be, um, you know, grieving, could be a death, could be a se severe physical injury, you don't, you want to minimize the stress to everyone else in your life, your family members in particular, and having that all set up so they know where to go, what to access is a very helpful thing. And you don't, you know, when you die, you don't want to leave a mess for your family. <laughs> so, and you don't want your family fighting over things or having contentious issues, uh, ideally, and have it all um, set out ahead of time. And ideally talk about it with your family members at some point. You know, many people don't talk about their wealth or their plans with mm -hmm. their children uh, or grandchildren. And I think it's generally a good idea to do that so that everyone knows what to expect and there aren't, uh, you know, hurt feelings or misperceptions should you pass on or become incapacitated. So have you heard from your readership? Because this sounds like something that I would think everyone can use. I've heard some, um, you know, you get some reviews on Amazon and other people uh, locally, and a few people have sent me notes. So uh, you're generally not going to hear if it's really bad, but generally <laughs> people have told me they liked it, found it useful, found it objective, and, you know, got some useful things out of it. So if, if even a few people can get a few useful things out of it, you know, I'm happy with that. Mm, and that is satisfying yeah. and rewarding as an author, someone yeah. even reading part of it. Right. So, uh, and do you have other plans for writing or not necessarily publishing, but you, you're, um, are you writing more? I'm not writing a book anytime soon. Um, you know, I, I wrote one book, I think if, if anyone can write one book, that's a great thing to do. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm doing some other uh, writing that uh, sort of writing for fun, but uh, uh, not a book currently in the offering. Yes, well, uh, writing for fun is is a nice hobby, or I would say is a um, yeah, luxury <laughs> for, right. for some people, for many right. people. Well, John, what connects you to Glenview? Well, I, we've lived here, my wife and I and our kids have lived here for over 20 years. So I don't know if that makes me a long-time resident, but uh, kids grew up here, and uh, yeah, my youngest is now off to college, uh, but we're still here. Yeah, well, that's a new stage in life, right. isn't it? Uh, and I know that you had appeared, or you had uh, hosted the um, uh, local Glenview media author program at the Glenview Library. Right, Public, uh, Glenview Public Library, Meet the Authors, so it was myself and a few other author, authors there, and uh, it was a, a very nice event, and got to meet some local people there at the library and talk about the book and uh, share it with them. I think that's a great place to start, right? Meeting, right. Meeting more people in Glenview. And have you um, promoted a book in other uh, marketing, uh, book marketing events? Uh, I've done some online. I've done some marketing campaigns. I've done some through Amazon, but I haven't gone out and, and you know, gone to a bookstore and done a signing and that sort of thing. I've done some, a uh, little bit of promotion on LinkedIn as well. Mm, that sounds like a yeah, good beginning. Right. I think definitely uh, saves a lot of effort <laughs> right. by, right. by spreading yourself or cloning yourself in some way. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, John, what is your message for other writers out there? Well, I don't pretend to tell anyone else what to do, but, um, you know, if you have something to say, you know, go ahead and say it. It's so easy today to um, publish a book, to do a, a video, post it on YouTube or through Amazon or another publisher with a book, write an article, do a blog post. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, the media makes it easy to do. Now, maybe writing the book is the hard part, but distributing it and publishing it is um, something that's very doable for just about anybody. It's not that expensive either to do. So if you really want to do something or say something, I would say go ahead and do it. You know, especially as someone like myself, if you're older and you're 
if you've, if you had kids and they're in college or now in their careers, um, you know, what else are you doing? Are you watching Netflix? Are you, you know, scrolling through your phone, looking at TikTok videos? Uh, you know, if you have something you'd like to write, you know, why not do it? Oh, I think that's an excellent advice for everyone. Thank you, John, for coming to uh, our program. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for watching. Join us next time on Off the Shelf.